The ultimate evidence of the Holy Spirit in our lives is not signs, miracles, wonders, gifts, tongues, faith, hope, or holiness. The greatest evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit in us is love. There are three things that will endure, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Love is how the world knows we are followers of Jesus. Love motivates us to minister to the least and the most difficult of these, and in doing so, to serve and love Jesus. Love inspires two great commandments that Jesus gave to us. Love agape, that is selfless, unconditional, and completely giving, is impossible without the help of the Holy Spirit. He pours God's love out of our hearts. For we know how dearly God loves us because He has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with His love. When the Holy Spirit fills us with love, every fear, every worry flees. This is God 321. And now, here's your host, Danny Hutchins. Well, hello, Detroit. Hello, Hamtramck. Hello, East Point. Hello, Gross Point. Hello, Browns Downtown. Hello, Flat Rock. It's Dan Hutchins, your host of God 321. I am so happy to be here this morning. It is absolutely gorgeous day, my goodness. I just left the uh, people at REMA. Uh, that's Restoring Hope uh, Through Education and Medicine or Medical Aid. And uh, REMA has the hospital in Bocasel. You know, we talk about that often and they are um they are helping out the people in Haiti. Uh Rima has a birthing center uh down there. They started out to train midwives uh, back in in 79 uh, I think it was 78 79 set up a program for uh helping to train midwives because the mortality rate down in Haiti uh you they were losing about six to seven children out of every ten. And so the hospital began for uh, training of midwives and birthing of children and then providing with some some sustaining foods and medications for the first three years, the critical three years of their life. And now the hospital is, it's amazing, since the it grew and grew and grew and remained a birthing uh, center, and then it became a full tertiary care after the earthquake. Uh, Bogusel is about 80 miles from Port-au-Prince, and it is in an area where the uh, it is flat. It was not destroyed. It is uh, available. Um, then the hospital uh, right there became a care center and a pharmacy, and now they have... They have last year distributed almost 400,000 uh, meals for uh, food. They distribute water, uh, medication. The U.S. Air Force had been there recently for two weeks. Two weeks they came. The total patient count that they handled in the two weeks was 6,369 patients. Um, general medication, they handled 2,400 dental 365, extractions 805, and preventive maintenance, uh, preventive care, okay, just in education, an additional 6,600 and um, people, and optometry, they handed out about a thousand glasses, and also checked out eyes, uh, 2,000 pediatric uh, minor surgery. That would have been skin lesions, uh, tumors, uh, 219 prescriptions, uh, 11,672 in dermatological issues, 350. And that was in, in, in about 10 to 12 working days. Uh, can you imagine the intensity of this? They brought 42 doctors and, and staff with them right to Boca Cell, uh, landed with their helicopters, got their equipment out. They slept locally in the air, setting up their tents, and they were out there every day 
from morning to late in the evening, brought their own generators, brought their own equipment to serve the people of Haiti. What an amazing, amazing uh, time that is to this hospital that is in Bocasel, the Rima Hospital, R-H-E-M-A. And that was founded by Patricia Beal Gruitz, founder and CEO of Rima International Ministries. They do not preach there the gospel. What they do is provide education and medical aid, education for medical aid, medical aid. If people ask, yes, they give the gospel. Yes, they give the message of salvation, but it's about an ass basis. They have been faithful to their calling. They, uh, since the, uh, the uh, earthquake, uh, uh, God had stepped them up. They are providing clothing. They're providing medication with a new pharmacy that has just recently opened. They have, uh, as I said before, handled out close to 400,000 meals. They're looking to hand out over 500,000 meals this year. They're providing pure water for the people in uh, Bocasel and those who come. So no one is turned away. 24-7 service. An amazing story uh, about this small little hospital. And you can listen to uh, Patricia Beal Gruitz on the radio. Pastor Reverend Patricia Beal Gruitz. She is on the radio on Saturday from 2 to 3 with us. And a repeat at night from 11 to 12. And you heard her last week. We had her on her first show, the first chapter of Understanding God. Foundational training. Foundational from this great woman of God. A woman who given a vision for Haiti. A woman given a vision for Understanding God. Program a foundational tool to everyone that talks about, you know, the beginning about God's people, the Old Testament covers the covenants of Moses, uh, of Noah, you know, each of the covenants goes through and covers the New Testament with the Holy Spirit's movement and the birth of the new church, okay, covers Christ's life and Christ's death and what happened at the cross and covers all that he had accomplished, that Jesus accomplished. It's it's a great program. It's running, it'll run 30 to 32 weeks on a, on a um, uh, basis. What we're doing is we're having a lesson, we have a little follow-up, we're going to be posting homework on, you know, on our website, God321.net. You'll be able to find it. It'll have its own page. You'll also be able to have find uh, Rabbi Lauren Jacobs, uh, the Messianic Jew, which is on with us on, on Tuesday. The education that we have there will be found on the uh, page too, so you can follow the, the, the understanding that um, Rabbi Jacobs is bringing to the show in his discussions with me every day. Today, we were supposed to have on the air Katie LaRoche, Miss Michigan 2010. But uh, Katie is not with us today, and we don't know where Katie is. She must have had an emergency. Katie was going to talk to us um, about her, her, she set up a a charity, a uh, foundation is what she set up, a nonprofit organization, One World, One Future. And she has a great passion, a passion about doing away, doing away, uh, bringing to light human trafficking. And I was amazed at some of the, the facts that she sent over to us. Human trafficking. Uh, in her, uh, she's telling us it's $32 billion a year industry currently uh, that we know, the statistics will tell. They also said that there is... 27 million, 27 million uh, people that are enslaved in the world. And that is on a measuring scale of, uh, they only know 
half of 1%. If that's a half of 1%, we're talking about a potential of a billion people enslaved around the world. And the majority of the slaves are women and young girls. Uh, in the United States, uh, an estimated 325,000 children are exploited in commercial sex industry in our country. After being tortured and abused, these children are often arrested and charged with crimes such as soliciting and are placed in detention centers without proper service they need to heal both physically and mentally. Uh, there's also an estimate of 14,500, 17,000 people trafficked, moved around, stolen, trafficked, transported, moved in to the United States, working as human slaves. And they are doing unthink they have an unthinkable life, often working with countless hours, sleeping behind padlocked doors and barred windows for uh, all kinds of nefarious purposes. You know, children, even in this city, people in this metropolitan area, children being slow, sold for drugs. They, uh, children are being traded and sold for drugs. You know, when parents run out of their drugs, they're looking, and when they get desperate and they get down to it, they, they sell their children, they sell their babies. How awful can that be? How desperate have we gotten? In Nepal, I guess Nepal is um, one of the poorest countries in the world. 26 million people who are just the poorest of the poor. And I know we have Haiti. I know we have many African nations that are also in the poorest. We're looking at the Sudan issue right now and the people... Uh, uh, going hundreds of miles with no food, n desperate for food, desperate for water. War is raging. And then we have war breaking up just over the food, the small food that comes in for the United Nations and trying to get the food from the United Nations, from uh, contributing countries to the Sudanese who are starving. There's a war to capture that food and to use it and to resell it. In uh, Nepal, young girls are barred and sold. That in many countries, uh, girls and women have very little value other than trading them for slavery. The female population between the ages of 8 and 18 is about 4 million. Most of them are at risk of being trafficked. The basic literacy rate among r rural women is 30%. And uh, 12,000 Nepalese girls, girls from Nepal, are known to be sold to brothels in India uh, just last year. Well, uh, like I said, I don't know what's going on with uh, Katie LaRoche. But we will have to look to reschedule her for a future program. I want to tell you uh, about, well, I didn't have a whole lot prepared, so we'll just talk. That's what we'll do. We'll, we'll wind up talking. I didn't prepare a program. I kind of left out in the cold a bit here, but we're all a little bit left out in the cold. But it's nice and warm outside. So, <laughs> what can I tell you about? Well, uh, let's talk about this is about love and romance and and kind of miracles of meeting. You know, my wife and I, Debbie, and Deborah, uh, have been together for forty two years uh, this year, uh, as of July the fifteenth. Uh, I met her after uh, in the Navy, and uh, I was coming out. I was 23 years old, and that was in 1969. Give you an idea how old I am. I'm 65 this year. But I was coming out of the Navy, and we we pray. And I was a, a young man, and I'd been going to church. I've told you before on the show that 
You know, I, I knew who God was. I've known God since I was five years old. And I've witnessed miracles since I was oh, younger than five. We're not recognized them as miracles at the time, but I knew they were miracles when I saw angelic beings save my mother's life when I was five years old. A privilege to do that. But I came out of the Navy, and I was... My father had left my family, and he had my mother, and he had divorced, and he had left. There was... Uh, three of us, my mother, myself. Uh, so uh, there were five that I came out of Navy to uh, support. And I met Debbie. And I met her on a blind date. I would, just got out of the Navy. Uh, was fixing up my car. Was going to work. I hadn't figured out yet that I could get unemployment. I didn't understand that after I got out of the Navy, after four years of being in the Navy, being in the Vietnam era in 69, leaving. I went in in 64 in June, and I got out in June of 69. And I got home, and I had a few dollars in my pocket. The Red Cross had been supporting my mother for the past year. They had been helping through the service to support my mom. My mother was pregnant when my dad left. She didn't know that. She was 40. And she was pregnant, and so I have a brother, two, 22 years younger than me. His name is Jeffrey. And that was all occurring right at that time. So the Red Cross, I went to them uh, when I got the letter when my father left, and I laid out the issue that I needed to help my family. And I didn't have the wherewithal, and they didn't have the wherewithal. And welfare back then, uh, there it existed, but it was uh, uh, less uh, than it was t- is today. Um, the processes were different. Uh, there was available, uh, but my mother had to go through the process of getting help and aid and food for my younger brothers and sisters. My sister, I was, uh, as I said, twenty five. My sister was four years younger. Uh, I'm 23, four years younger, which made her just turning uh, 19. And then we had the 22 year younger, and I had Joey, who was 11 years younger than I was at that time, making him, uh, making him about 12. So we were a family. I got out. I was working on a car that I picked up for very little in the service, and drove it back home, and. I was underneath the car, and a neighbor came down the street. I hadn't dated anybody. I hadn't been home. I hadn't even thought about that. Say, so, okay, I wasn't even thinking about a date. I was thinking about making some money and finding a job. And I was laying underneath this car. Um, it was a, a Nash Rambler. It's anybody who remembers Nash, a, a Rambler at that time, kind of a boxy car. Uh, yet... Uh, my neighbor came down the street. Her name was Mary Champion, a nice lady, a nice lady. And she uh, looked in through the hood, and she said, uh, Danny, would you like to go on a date with a nice girl? I said, Mary, I'm laying out of this car. What do you think? <laughs> yes, no, I'm working on the car. I crawl out from under here. And I have to go take a shower. I have to go clean up. And, you know, I, I, I have to get this done. I have to fix this car. And I need to go to work tomorrow. I've, I've got it planned. I was going to an agency where you would go and wait. And uh, people would call in for um, different uh, skills. And you could have day labor. So it was a day labor program that you hope to turn into another job. And uh, so I headed, I was working on the car. Mary said, hey, you want a date? I said, no. She said, why not? I said, can't you see I'm working? So she left and she went down the street, ran down the street and uh, came back with a photo. She stuck her head under the hood and she handed me the photo and said, well, what about this girl? I said, what do you mean? What about you? She said, her name is Debbie Nalines. 
And I look at this is her grad, high school graduation picture. And I looked at the picture and I said, well, lovely girl. But no, no, thanks. Don't want to do that. Nope. Don't want to go out on a date trying to get my car fixed up. And then Mary persistently said, what is the problem here? Why won't you go on a date? Well, I said, why do you want me to go on this date? And she said, well, Debbie's younger sister, she is dating my son, and I really like her. And she's really good for my boy. And they can go out, but they can't stay out very late. It's, you know, school night unless they have a chaperone. And her sister is two years older. And so she can go with them. Uh, and uh, she can go out with them. And excuse me, what do we have? We have a call. Ah, I have a backup. <laughs> Pam Monsoor. We had Pam Monsoor on before. Should I stop this story now? I got to stop the story and tell you. So you guys get to be suspenseful. How I met with my wife, we have a, a backup on. And uh, hello, Pam Mansour. Well, hi, Danny. How are you today? Well, thank you. You are my backup on the show. And I'm so yeah, happy. Yeah, that's what I understand. Well, I'm happy to have you as my backup. I was just basically, I was telling... I was telling a tale how I met my wife. <laughs> oh, well, so the audience is going to have to wait because... for that story. Oh, then. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to have you back. Tell tell the audience again who you are and 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 about your consulting service. Okay. Uh, uh, my name is Pam Monshore, and I'm a professional counselor, and my practice is called. Breaking Free Counseling. Um, my office is located in Westland, and I am a professional partner of Life Care Christian Center, which is a um, uh, you know a ministry that has a support group ministry. Uh, we do retreats and um, a lot of other types of um, ministry activities. Um, and along with um, being a part of the Each Each Initiative, which is um, where a lot of different churches come together uh, to do various types of ministry opportunities as well. And last time we were on, we were going through the the different uh, services you have in that counseling, because you you do grief counseling uh, predominantly, yes. Well, yes, that's one of my areas of specialty. Um, I have um, put together a workshop that I do periodically um, through the year and at different locations called Healing Through Life's Losses. And it is a workshop that deals primarily with grief and loss. That's the primary thing. and uh, But it is throughout the, the life of a person um, it can it's not just uh, limited to uh, a loss through death this particular workshop but what I thought I could share with your listeners today is uh, we had spoke about the last time I was there about how to help someone who is grieving we talked about that but there was another part we talked about that we didn't get to we talked about helping those people grieving and what you were sharing with us that there are more, there's more to grieving than we actually recognize because we, we have the thoughts of, uh, uh, you know, we have grieving down where we grieve for a lost one. We grieve, uh, you know, a lost child, a lost mother, lost father. We grieve for a lost job. We grieve for uh, death, you know, uh, uh, an accidental, uh, we grieve heavy for an accidental loss. We grieve for a lot more things than just uh, right now we're grieving the fact that we've lost our job and and we're going to have our houses foreclosed on. We grieve for a loss of our 401k program. Uh, So there are a lot, there's a lot, we do a lot more grieving than we actually recognize. We do. And as a matter of fact, uh, part of the purpose of my workshop that I do 
is to help people to recognize the 11 major losses that they might experience, and that's what we talked about last time is uh, how they are all, um, you know, the different types of losses, and they may be, in fact, losses that we really do not identify them as a loss, right. um, and so they could be relational loss, but all those things that you mentioned for sure are a part of that, um, and then there's many others as well. And um, today I had put together uh, to talk about um, how when we encounter someone who is grieving, what are the do's and don'ts of how we might help that that grieving individual person. Well, the other thing that you talked about that I was hoping we could deal with in this time slot is I told you that when I'm down at Children's Hospital or when I'm talking to a child with leukemia or a serious illness, and we're talking about very young children, 6, 7, mm-hmm. 8, 10, 12 years old, that what, what I hear when I ask them a question, what's the hardest thing for you being in the hospital for long periods of time or in uh, having your uh, treatments uh, for those who have cancer, uh, what is the hardest, hardest thing? And the kids, per hundred percent, will say dealing with visitors and especially dealing with my mom and dad coming because I have to rise to the occasion. I have to, I have to comfort them. Uh, I have to to rise up and comfort them. And said it's very, very difficult. When my parents come and they they are grieving so much, and, and I have to get the strength together to comfort them. Yeah, those those parents, especially in that type of a situation, really do need a support system. Um, other, you know, friends and family, church members, you know, of course, but they need to have an outlet for them to be able to talk about their fears, to talk about what their worries are regarding their child, to even just verbalize about all that they have to go through in order to get their child to the hospital. Um, You know, it may be that the child is there for an extended period of time, or it could be that they just have to take the child periodically for treatments. And so this parent is left with, Um, all of the feelings that they have, that for many of them, they hold all of those feelings in. They don't really verbalize them. It it really does depend on what type of support system that they already have in place. But for many parents in that situation, um, they may feel as if uh, it's not okay for them to talk about the feelings that they have. And um, so many of them have frustrations. Uh, They may struggle with the issue of anger, um, especially Especially uh, perhaps even with anger at God for the fact that their child is suffering in this way. And so it is very, very painful for them. If they are a strong believer, it can be very difficult for them to even admit that they are angry at God. And um, it is it is okay to be angry at God, but what they want to do, what's important for them to do, is to talk about the, how they feel. It's well, so yeah, vitally important. It is, but it's also important to to look at. Uh, we don't um, Americans are unusual people, and that when I you know travel around the world, particularly to Japan, and even to Germany and some of the other countries to China, that um, they're used to being silent. They're okay with not talking. They're, they're good with being by themselves. They learn because there's so many people to, to be quiet, to be in an island. Uh, we have a hard time with silence in this country in any form. We just talk, 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 talk. So going to your child's Mm -hmm. room or to a loved one's room and bringing a book and and coming in and sitting down and just being there, 
being there to listen, being there to read to yourself, being just there, allowing them to rest, to sleep, to just your presence. We, we don't understand that our presence can often be more comfort, comfort than our voices, uh, more comfort than us asking questions, more comfort than us just babbling, you know, on that. Just the fact that we're there, that we care, that we're close and and uh, they can reach out and talk to us when when the patient feels it's needed or necessary or desirable. Yes, and and that is so true that um, we definitely do have an issue with just being silent. Where uh, for for whatever reason, you know, our culture um, believes that. Um, we have to be talking about this, talking about that, especially uh, visiting someone in the hospital, a patient. And, of course, that patient is um, exhausted. They're ill, um, especially at a child. If a child is receiving treatment, um, you know, they're, they're very, very uh, stressed. Their body is stressed. Their emotions are stressed. And so... Um, and it is true what you said, what they really desire, what they want more than anything, first of all, is to not be alone while they're there. Uh, any patient that is in the hospital, uh, anyone going undergoing uh, cancer treatment, uh, if they're hospitalized, they really do not want to be alone, but they don't want to feel as if they have to, uh, in a way, uh, entertain the guest, the person who is visiting. And so, uh, for instance, with a parent that is, you know, their child is hospitalized, just being there next to their child, just touching their child, the, the, one of the things that's really important is human touch, and that touch is comforting. But, you know, of course, you have to keep in mind, depending on what the, the, the patient is dealing with, like what their, uh, the issue is of what they're being treated for, you know, you would have to gauge that against, you know, how much you can touch them and things like that. But, um, but, but just being there, just sitting there, um, and, and, and quite frankly, with a child, reading to that child from a book um, is where it, they, they know that you're there, you know, they know that your presence is there, and, you know, especially if it's a favorite book, um, you know, that is a wonderful way to just uh, show that, that child that you love them um, and or show that patient, even an adult patient that is in the hospital for an extended period of time, just having someone come and just sit there. I mean, just even just sitting there. You don't have to even say anything. Um, is a huge comfort to anyone uh, undergoing those types of treatments. Yes, and also we tend to shower. You know, our children. We uh, we bring things. You know, to the room. We got to bring this. We got to bring stuffed animals. We got to bring piles of this. Your toys this way that you know that they don't necessarily need, want, or endure. Mm-hmm. We feel compelled to bring an offering. You know, with that. And, right. Yes, and and they don't want it. You know, don't need it. It you know it requires energy. The things are you know uh, pile up there. But we feel compelled to talk. We feel compelled to bring something. You know, uh, I don't know if it's guilt. Is it guilt? Why we behave? Why we have to bring something? Why we have to constantly talk and just fill up the space instead of just being and touching, as you said, or sitting. You know, just bringing ourselves and devoting some time. We hurry in, we hurry out. You look at uh, many parents have been there. They're in such a rush. They rush down. Yes, they love their children. They rush in, you know, like a whirlwind. You know, touch, 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 talk, 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 uh, provide present, 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 and uh, jabber, jabber, and then leave. You know, then just rush out. Well, you know, I I think... Ultimately, what I really believe what is the reason for the uncomfortableness with the silence and the really even the uncomfortableness of, like you say, they they rush in, they they buy something because they feel as if, okay, that's a way that I can show love. But I think what it really ultimately comes down to is how much our culture, um, they uh, they avoid death. just completely. Um, our, our culture is not comfortable with death. They're not comfortable with sickness. 
And so when, you know, when they have to encounter these things, um, whether it is a friend or a family member, and, you know, especially if it's their child, um, the parent is very, it's un- they're uncomfortable. Yeah, we're, so therefore they do not know what to do. We're and uncomfortable so what with their own mortality. Exactly. Well, that's part of it. That is definitely part of it. The fact that, um, it, you know, when their child is in the hospital and if they're especially being treated for a very serious illness, it is a reminder of our immortality and that we do not live forever and that, you know, depending on the child's situation, you know, the child could potentially have a terminal illness. Yeah. And so, therefore, that parent is struggling with every emotion that you could possibly imagine, um, you know, because they they want to deny what is occurring, but yet they want to, they, they try, really, what ultimately is, people do the best that they can, but death is okay because death is a part of life, and people need to become comfortable with the fact that we have a life cycle and that we are the time that we die is God's time you know we are not in charge of that we are not in control of that God is in control of that ultimately and there needs to be a way for um, for us to find an acceptance of really illness and suffering even you know, life is hard, and sometimes we suffer. Sometimes we um, we we are ill, and uh, that is a part of the life cycle. You know, every every family, you know, deals with these different things. Of course, you know, different families deal with these things in different ways, and it does make a difference as well on um, what your cultural background is um, or your ethnic background. Um, there there are differences there as well. Yes, that's true, and we also see that, uh, particularly in high school or anything goes on more, but if you have an active uh, daughter or an active son and there's an accident, if you have this football here or, or this tennis star or this swimming star, and there's an accident, and that person has a broken spine, broken neck, or a severe injury where they no longer mm-hmm. can be that star, then the 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 movement to the hospital, of course, initially people go 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 for for a week. You know, here in this country, grief you know lasts a week. You know, and mm-hmm. that people are shocked, people uh, coming around, people sharing, people offering, and then it dies off quickly. And then that person is left alone, particularly if they they've had a serious accident and they potentially will not be who they were or at the capacity that they were at. There seems to be a great yeah. disappointment, you know, like the person failed us. We don't understand sickness, illness. We don't understand even accident and injury. We don't understand uh, really until, you know, recently with, you know, with therapy, even we don't even understand the importance of being there when people are coming back when they're working their way back to whatever life, you know, that they can put back together. We don't applaud that uh, rehabilitation often. Right, right. Yeah, well, that that is absolutely true. Um, there is almost a, um, a sense of um, uh, where a person, um, where there's like an expectation, you know, like you say, of... Um, it's going to last this long, and then, you know, everything's going to be okay. But the fact is, of course, there's varying degrees of, like you say, rehabilitation, depending on someone's injury. Um, and really the most important time for others to be a support to the, either that person or that family is later not in the very beginning. In the in the very beginning, there is overwhelming support. In fact, there's almost too much support. Yes, and that is it's almost like it's it's too much. Overwhelming. But Everybody over rushes. Time, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and over time, though, where they where the support wanes and it, it you know it, it 
dies off, what really is the greatest need is that later time yes. where, like you say, people move on. They really do. They move on. It's almost as if um, life goes on. Well, and it's like the media. Go about their business. We're media-driven. Yeah. You know, we have a tsunami. You know, we all run out. We hit our apps. We contribute our 5 10 $15. Boom, 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 boom. Instantly, we rush down. We put money in the pot. You know, we mail off a check. You know, the media runs the story for a week, week and a half, two weeks possibly. Wow, everybody's in a fear. And as soon as the media dies down, we all just go back to life. And we've done what we've done. We feel relieved because we've made some type of an emotional contribution or physical contribution or both. And But then we just go on and it's all forgotten. It's all gone. Well, and you know what really needs to happen is engagement. Life on life engagement is something I think that our that we struggle with. Um, you know, like you say, it's easy to you know either mail off a check or put a check in the pot or you do some quick thing. But what really is needed, and what you know what God desires for us relationally, is this life on life connection. Yes, yeah, a good where we Samaritan can connect with each mm-hmm. other. Yeah, and so that when we encounter these life events that, you know, honestly may occur to all of us in varying degrees, you know, um, you know, I, you know, I don't know what you've experienced in your life, but you know, my father uh, died from lung cancer that went to brain cancer, and you know, and so you know, we've experienced that in our family. I've had uh, my my brother died at a young age. And so, you know, we each person, each family experiences all these different uh, varying degrees of life events. And when you when you don't have this life on life connection with others, which is so vital, then when we encounter those times, really, those are our support system. And I think what happens with most most people don't have a support system. They may attend church, they may be in a small group, but for many people, it is difficult for them to be um, really life-on-life connected with people because, like you say, in our fast-paced, media-driven world, um, everything moves so quickly, and that requires, life-on-life connection requires a slowing down of, you know, of our lives. Because you know you can't you can't connect life on life you know you know at uh, you know fifty miles an hour you know it, it it's a, it's slow and you know you slowly um, engage with each other um, you know it's important to engage with neighbors uh, you know I have a neighbor right now who um, is the same age as my husband and I we've lived in our neighborhood for twenty nine years and um, our neighbor had an aneurysm. And, uh, you know, he has since had multiple seizures. And so we've really connected. We've, you know, we've always been connected to our neighbor, but we really connected in a more specific way to this neighbor in order to assist them. Uh, Sometimes we go over and just sit with him so that she can do errands or various things. And and so, but, but it requires effort to do that. Yes, and it I does. think many people shy away from that. Well, it, and it is about the after the incident. It is about the long term. I had a situation to talk to a lady named Nancy, and she's saying that she had a very serious operation where she could not leave her house. She was bedridden. She didn't have the uh, a single woman. Uh, she didn't have the help. She and she her friends she had immersed herself into work yeah she went to a church so she had a church but she was single uh she had gone to some of the groups but she had made a connection but when she had this surgery she said in the beginning of course people wrote the the notes the people from the church came out you know to meet greet mm-hmm. to see her the deacon the elder stopped by periodically to check her and then she gets out of the hospital, and of course today they put you in. They, uh, you know, it's like they uh, run you through the car wash, and then they they send you home. 
you know, that evening yeah. or, or a couple of days, no matter how serious. And you're at home. If you have money, you can hire a, a house nurse or you can hire uh, someone to, you know, to be with you. But, you know, you can only afford to do that so long. But she said the real angel or the help, there was two people, one from the church and a neighbor that was a few blocks away who she did not know, who had mm-hmm. heard of her need. That neighbor and that church, went, she, the neighbor came every morning to knock on and say, can I pick you up some groceries? Can I take your cleaning? Can I get you? Can I bring you something? Then she would stop by on her way home from work. She would bring those things that she bought during the day. If there was no purchase or nothing else, she would stop by anyway. What do you need? What can I get you? Uh, Take a look around the house. And without... And we all feel bad about telling someone else what we need. And we're so independent in this country. We we Mm -hmm. begrudgingly don't want to tell. You know, I don't need any help. You know, I don't need you. Don't help me. I'm good. Thank you very much, please. (laughs) And then as soon as they go out the door, they say, oh, my gosh, why didn't I tell them this? Why why didn't I let them help me? And then the one lady in church stopped by two, three times a week. So for six months, these two ladies... Between the two of them, they Mm -hmm. made sure that Nancy had everything she needed. And if there was medication to pick up, you know, if this was that, if she, even if she could not get to the hospital, one said, I can come by this and this time, make the appointment here. I will see that you get there. So two people out of a, out of a whole church, two people out of Mm -hmm. the employees at her job. She said there was about 40 employees where she worked, but one person from there, one person the other said, but I'm going to do the right thing, the long thing. I'm not going to rush into this. I'm going to be there, be there, be there through through her need. Now, that's being, mm-hmm. that's being a friend. That's being yeah. a family. You know, that's putting yeah. yourself out. That's being what Jesus said. You know, that's that's yeah. going and truly, truly helping, not dropping off a stuffy, fluffy, you know. Right? Right. Well, and, and the thing is, is that's Jesus with skin on. You yes, know? Jesus, that's what, that's that what he wants. That's Jesus with hands. Yeah. Yeah, with skin on. Yeah. Yes, that's the Holy hands Spirit with skin on. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And the good thing about <laughs> that is that those individual people recognize the need and they, they stepped up to make the commitment to fulfill whatever that need was for that person. And, you know, many people shy away from that where they feel as if they, you know, I, I think many people do not um, go forward with it. They may have this um, idea that, you know, they would like to help, but then they do not they, they're not really exactly sure how to tangibly help someone. And so instead of um, doing something, what they do is they, they do nothing because they don't know what to do. And what's better is to ask, um, you know, especially in a situation like that, um, it is good that they stepped up and did that. But um, it is also good to say, you know, because, for instance, a single person they have lawn work they need to have done. They need grocery shopping. Yeah. They need like laundry done. They need e- their home. Excuse cleaning. me, they Pam. We've got all types. Pam, mm-hmm. we got less than two minutes. Yeah. What I want you to do? Okay. Yes, we need all the basics. I want you to tell people again who you are and how they can get a hold of you. Okay. How okay. they can you know sure. get a hold of your group because you're going to be back. Sure. So we're not going to let you go with this. So you tell people who okay. you are. Sure. Uh, my name is Pam Onshore, and I'm with Breaking Free Counseling. And this weekend, I'll be doing a workshop called Healing Life Losses. And my office is in Westland. Um, and my phone number is 313-414-0923. You can register for the workshop that is this weekend at Calvary Missionary Church. And it's through Life Care Christian Center, 
and it's from 10 a.m. until 3 p.m. this Saturday, the 13th of August. Well, thank you, Pam, and thank you for being with me. We've got less than one minute, so I have to close this out. You're welcome. Thank you so much. You're and, welcome. And, and, you know, you come back to us because we got lots to talk about. This is Dan Hutchins, okay. God321.net. You can reach me at Dan Hutchins, God321. Dot net. That's our email. And we are going to be repeated tonight, 11 to 12. You're going to hear this show. And I want you to know that that on Saturday, again, we're going to have the programs with Patricia Beal, Groovich, Reverend Beal, Understanding God. It could be, it's on Saturday. We have that time. We're on from 2 to 3, training you. We love you. Thank you for being with us today. I'm sorry that our guest, uh, Miss Michigan, was not here with us. She's absolutely gorgeous, absolutely smart, and absolutely tardy. Okay. (laughs) We are out of here. Thanks for listening to God 321 with Dan Hutchins. God 321 is sponsored by Dihydro Services, Inc. To learn more about the person of the Holy Spirit, visit God321.net. That's God321.net. Or call 586-978-0541. That's 586-978-0541.